Well, I've been at it again. I get home from college, and the first thing I do is start hitting the thrift stores. Because the ones around here are um, quite a bit more interesting than the ones up in Rochester. Uh, so... <laughs> Actually, why, why don't I, for this video, why don't I just catch up on all things uh, thrift store and uh, whatnot finds. Because uh, I got a few other things here that I don't think I've shown on video yet. I apologize if I have and I've forgotten about it. Um, let's actually start with some things I found up in Rochester. This, I think I hinted at this in the chat on somebody's show. This is a Philips Model 212 turntable. This came out of the um, so-called bargain basement. Uh, it's kind of like curbside discount, except it's a... Uh, Recycling bin in the basement of the chemistry building on the U of R campus. <laughs> um, don't ask why this was in that building, but it was in the trash, so I felt the need to grab it. It What with it being an old turntable and whatnot. Um, it was actually in relatively good shape for what it was. The needle was actually still at least somewhat good. Um, the only major problems were the belt was shot, which I've since fixed. I ordered a new one from turntableneedles.com that came and popped it right in there and we were good to go. Uh, and the power switch was broken. There was a switch in there originally, but it was stuck in the off position. So I took it out. For now, I just took it out and jumped it. And now I just have it plugged into the switched outlet on my uh, JVC integrated amp down here. Um, one thing that I find very interesting about this is that it has touch-sensitive controls on it. So, let me turn this thing on so you can see what I mean. Oh, and all the lights in here work, despite being incandescent. <laughs> Quite surprisingly. Um, what I mean is, just barely tap that, and it activates. And, you know, you tap that, shuts off. See, that one also works correctly. Um, and it is actually smart. It will not let you select the other speed without hitting stop first. Um, but yeah, I am a bit of a sucker for these sort of touch-sensitive buttons, <laughs> I will admit. Um, it probably has something to do with the... Um, when I was really introduced to the concept when, upon seeing uh, for the first time the uh, old... Um, uh, touch-sensitive elevator buttons that Otis produced for a while. Was, what, from like the 40s or 50s through the 70s, I believe? I think something like that. Um, and I, I always kind of thought this that sort of design was cool. So, um, it also has a, uh, a, a, a speed adjustment controls on the top panel here, which is quite handy sometimes. Uh, if you realize it's not set right, you don't have to pop the thing open to readjust it. Um, so that's always nice. Um, so moving down here a little bit, got another piece that I got recently. This I think I got at the end, I actually got here at the end of spring break, but then never got a chance to make a video about it as I recall. Uh, this is a TAC A640 cassette deck. And you can tell it really screams 1970s with that font there. Uh, I got this at one of the local thrift stores. Um, I don't remember what its problem was when I got it, actually. Uh, I don't remember if it was a belt issue or what. But it was something very simple, because I had it working before I left for Rochester again. <laughs> so here I actually have it without the, um, with the wood grain sides taken off. It had, actually has an interesting design. Had wood grain sides, but there was actually a metal case underneath. And so what I did was, in order to make it fit on this shelf, I took the wood grain sides off, and they're sitting somewhere in the mess here. <laughs> so, if I ever take it off this shelf, you know, or put it elsewhere, I will put those sides back on, but for now I just need to keep them off to get it to fit here. Um, now this, as you saw in my previous video, is a Sanjian HDT1 HD radio tuner. This was actually given to me by one of the engineers at WXXI, the uh, radio station, well, radio and TV, actually, station in Rochester where I was interning last semester and will probably end up interning again 
when I get back up there in the fall because they they seem to want to drag me back there quite a bit. <laughs> they 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 they're trying to do anything they can to get me back. So uh, that's probably a good thing, but yeah. Um. So yeah, this seems to work quite nicely, except for the um, the pad data issue, as you saw in my previous video, where it apparently responds in a funny way to empty pad fields being transmitted, such that if we turn this on here, um, let's see if it ever links to that. It's a little finicky. See, it just displays this useless one. Now, what I think is actually going on here is I suspect the station is actually transmitting proper pad data. The problem is they're also transmitting a field, most likely the comments field or something like that. It's one of those, one of those long message fields. They're also transmitting a field that they're not using, and in this case just contains garbage data. Um, but this radio responds to the presence of that field by blocking out the entire display and displaying that. So... In other words, it's kind of the fault of both the receiver and the station. So, if anybody uh, from anybody uh, from the uh, engineering department of any of these stations, uh, they, almost every station in the D.C. area, actually, is watching this, you might want to take out the unused fields from your uh, pad data. It's kind of messing with these receivers. I don't think these... This particular model is particularly uncommon either, so it's probably messing with many more people than just me. So, either way, rant over for now. <laughs> um, anyway, why don't we move on to... Oh, wait, there's one other thing here. Got this Netgear router. It's a WNR2000 V3. Picked this up at Goodwill the other day uh, and very quickly flashed DDWRT onto it, so now I finally have a wireless N-capable the DWRT router to play with. Um, so that's always cool. Now, for the stuff I picked up today. First, we have this thing. This paid all of seven bucks for this. It's a kind of El Cheapo Metrosonics branded uh, FM radio. But as you can see, as it proclaims in big letters on the uh, label next to the switch, this is not just any FM radio. It also can tune to subcarriers, apparently. Um, I'm not entirely sure how that's done here. It looks like it must be fixed to a specific subcarrier on each station, given I don't see any way to change subcarriers. I'm not entirely well versed on how all that works, so I suspect it's probably locked to, you know, I would assume it's locked to one particular subcarrier frequency and then you just tune to whichever station you want and it just and if you switch this to SCA it will tune whatever's on that particular subcarrier of the station um, at the moment I te attempted to test this out it does not seem to be working at the moment so it's probably heading for the workbench uh, very shortly but yeah I've never seen a subcarrier receiver that isn't locked to a particular station before normally you get ones that are locked down that are, you know, given out as part of radio reading services or things like that. In fact, WXXI does that for their reach-out radio service. Um, they just have a, you know, essentially a receiver that's just, the receivers that they loan out to people who are eligible for it, and it basically just has, a, you know, a power switch and a volume knob on it, and it just automatically tunes to uh, 91.5, the, uh, to 91.5 subcarrier. Or that whichever subcarrier area it is, I cannot remember for the life of me which what frequency what the subcarrier frequency was. Um, but yeah, so that's what this is, kind of an El Cheapo, El Cheapo device, but quite an interesting little feature there. Um, here is another one of the more interesting things I found. This here is a Turtle Beach. Audiotron unit. This is essentially in a um, component network audio player. This can actually, I was looking this up in the store as I was deciding whether or not to buy it. Uh, this actually um, can connect here. I'll show you. Let me flip this around. Can connect to 
Ethernet, or I'm not entirely sure what it does with the phone line. I'm not sure if it's supposed to use dial-up or what. Um, from what I understand, this is old enough it could be. Um, but it connects to your network and can play music off of a, uh, you know, a NAS or something like that on your network. Um, it has Toslink and analog RCA outputs. Um, but yeah, this ought to be a rather interesting device to play with. Um, got it for all of 20 bucks. So, I'd say that's a pretty good deal. And now, of course, last but not least, uh, apparently, I seem to have gotten bitten by the clock radio bug, uh, like many people in the uh, SDP community seem to have. In fact, it's probably partially their fault that I did. Um, but this turned up at Goodwill today. Um, this is a GE uh, clock radio. Where is the model number on this? If I can find it. Let's see. There it is. Model number. Uh, oh, now if my camera would focus, that would be handy. 7 dash. 4662B. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the display doesn't come up nicely on camera, but it looks like a um, VFD behind um, an actual, I think it's actually a blue tinted bit of plastic there. Um, hadn't seen one quite like, let me see if I can turn down the bright, there we go, that's a little better. Turn down the brightness there, obviously the clock's not set right. It's not 8.13 a.m. Um, has these kind of touch buttons. Not like the touch buttons on the um, turntable, but kind of like a um, one of these pads over a little tiny switch inside. Um, so, and they do kind of click a bit, but you know, it's an interesting design, I'd say. Um, the radio does work. Um, turn that off before I get my video muted or anything. Uh, but yeah, so that's, um, that's one interesting clock radio. Now here's the other one. This, for all of six bucks, as the price tag proclaims, is a Zenith Circle of Sound clock radio. Um, interestingly, despite having the old Zenith logo and everything, it does have an LED display on it. So, not quite something I would have expected. Um, again, the clock is not set right, obviously. It's definitely not 3.30 a.m. Um, let's see, what the model number on this one is model R472. Um, it is, however, old enough that it still has the separate... AFC switch on it, um, and the radio does, I believe, work on this one too. Yep. I'm trying to do this one-handed here. Target your tumor. Well. Kind of get the idea. Oh, that's right. Where is the switch on there? There it is. <laughs> Forgot where the switch was on this for a second. But yeah. So, this is one of those interesting designs. Zenith did this. This was the, how their circle of sound thing worked. The speaker is actually under here. And it actually has this kind of guide thing. You know, kind of a um, waveguide thing here. And it actually, the sound is actually kind of projected out from the sides of the stand here. It's an interesting design, definitely. Uh, we've got a couple other controls on the back here. Display advanced fast and slow. This sort of clock set, I'll just say, kind of drives me nuts. I much prefer the minute and second adjustments. <laughs> um, but then again, I ought to get used to it given this style set uh, uh, clock setting, or something very similar to it actually, is used a lot in broadcasting with master clocks and such things. Although, really, you should be syncing those to GPS anyway. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. So, that's what I got. 
couple very interesting clock radios. And yeah, so I might do future videos with more details on these two and the other stuff I got. But for now, that will be it. Thanks for watching. And be sure to stay tuned for more coming up here on If You Like Good Ideas.